is it that we find ourselves surrounded by such complexity, such elegance? The genes of you and me, the genes of you and me, we're all made of DNA. We're all made of the same chemical DNA. Happy Rare Disease Day. I'm your host, Kira Dean, and here on DNA Today, I have a special episode today on February 29th, the rarest day of the year, celebrating Rare Disease Day. I have interviews with two people with rare diseases, as well as the director of the Fibro Lamellar Cancer Foundation. So there are events worldwide sponsored by NORD, which is the National Organization for Rare Disorders, and Connecticut hosts two um, events. One was in Hartford at the State House on Thursday, February 25th, and the other one is actually today in New Haven at Quinnipiac University. Starts at 1 p.m., so if you're free, definitely get out there. If you're uh, close enough and go to the event, it's really an awesome experience, and I'm going to get into the experience of being at the State House event uh, a couple days ago and just how impactful the event really was. But before I do, I want to let everyone know about a rare disease tweet chat taking place tomorrow, March 1st. This is a fantastic opportunity you can take part in, especially if you can't attend a rare disease day event in person. You can join Nord and ABC News in this nationwide discussion. It's taking place again March 1st tomorrow from 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. Eastern time. And Dr. Richard Besser, the chief of the ABC News Medical Health Unit, will be live tweeting answer live tweeting answering questions from his Twitter handle at Dr. Richard Besser. And Marshall Lanes, who is Nord's genetic counselor and medical educator, will also be answering questions through the Twitter handles at Rare Diseases, which is Nord's Twitter handle, and at Rare Day US, which is the Rare Disease Day um, Twitter account. Now, Nord describes the tweet chat as an opportunity for patients, experts, the rare disease community, and the public to come together, ask questions, get answers, and raise important awareness as a part of Rare Disease Day. One goal of the the tweet chat is to bring widespread recognition of rare diseases as a public health challenge worldwide because it affects everybody, no matter where you live in the world, um, no matter what your socioeconomic background is, rare diseases affect everybody because it's in our genetics. So the tweet chat moderator will be at ABC. DRB chat. And the most important thing to remember is the hashtag for the tweet chat. That's hashtag ABC DRB chat. Again, that's hashtag ABC capitalized DRB chat. So by including this hashtag, your tweets will be linked to the discussion and seen by Dr. Besser and Norgen Counselor Marsha Lanes. And tweet chats are awesome to take advantage of because you are looking at this feed of all of these people talking and you might seem a little chaotic, but the way it works is that there are questions put out there uh, by moderators, and people can answer them or contribute to the conversation by including the hashtag um, and even answering more questions to fuel conversation even further and have personal questions answered about things. So it's really kind of an open forum with the focus of having speaking about rare diseases. So I'll post the link in the show notes on dnapodcast.com if you want to learn more about it um, and the particulars of actually having a tweet chat. They explain that all on there. Um, But I'll post that on the episode show notes, uh, dnapodcast.com. So the Connecticut State House event in Hartford was one of many events being held in the world and that are still being held to raise awareness for rare diseases this year. And these events were targeted towards legislators, legislative staff, the public, and the media in an effort to raise awareness of the needs of the rare disease community. And it is vital to educate our state legislators about many challenges that the rare disease community faces, as many important decisions related to rare diseases are made at the state level. So these are the people we really need to educate in order to make big impacts and big changes for people affected by rare diseases. So at the State House, there was a variety of speakers present, uh, including people with rare diseases, legislators, researchers, um, advocates. They were all part of the event and speaking up there, um, and there was a lot of networking and a sense of community. So people affected by rare diseases and parents of children's parents of children with rare diseases spoke about their experience. Some had the audience even close their eyes while they described how it was to live with a lifelong chronic illness and just a day in their life. So it really had a human aspect um, as a couple of the interviews that I had, we talked about that human aspect of really adding to the event and people learning and relating to people with rare diseases. 
Jackie and Eloise spoke about what it's like to have Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, and they both shared how hard it is to live with constant pain every day. Jackie is 15 years old and already an activist for rare diseases. I'm here with Jackie and Eloise at the Rare Disease event at the State House in Hartford, and we're here celebrating Rare Disease Day. Um, so I was going to ask them a couple questions just about um, Jackie's disorder, um, her many disorders, and a little bit about what we're doing today and what Rare Disease Day is all about. So why don't you start with telling us about your nine, did you say, disorders? Okay. <laughs> um, so initially I have Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, and that causes eight other things. I have gastroparesis, um, Chiari-1 malformation, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, dysautonomia, mast cell activation disorder, a PI-1 deficiency blood disorder, a calcium ion channel deficiency, and, and Renaud syndrome. I always forget Renaud's. Oh, and oh, I'm missing one else. Um, what is it? I have it. I always forget something. Mass cell activation disorder. Yeah. <laughs> so how are they all related? Well, Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome is a connective tissue disorder, and connective tissue makes up about 80% of your body. So in 80% of your body, you have the chance to have other problems, and that's why it will cause all of those other problems, and you just end up having a lot of internal issues. Interesting. And so you're presenting today. You're one of the presenters. Um, how did you get involved in the rare disease community? You're younger, so it's really <laughs> inspirational to see that you're at a young age, um, and getting involved. How did you get involved? Uh, well, last year um, I became very ill and uh, my mom and I noticed that there wasn't really a lot of knowledge about what I was going through and so we kind of put together a little uh, fundraiser called Jack's Legacy, which actually and, um, started out as my Instagram name and then we just used it as the name for the program. And we used that to, um, to get to get together a, um, a 5K race uh, to kind of raise awareness and knowledge and funds. And, um, and then from that, we just kind of got calls from a couple different people and we just made more connections. And now I'm here and I'm really excited. And, and uh, being able to talk is something I'm really, you know, I'm glad I can do that. Yeah. yeah, it's definitely big to get up in front of people and talk, and that's awesome that you've held 5Ks and <laughs> Jackie's legacy. Definitely. Can we find that on social media? Well, you said Instagram, but also websites. Yeah, yeah um, so it's on my Instagram, and then we also have a Facebook page, and it's actually just Jack's legacy, J-A-X, and um, we have a Facebook page, and do we have a website for it? No. no. Not really a website, but it's pretty much just a Facebook page, and uh, yeah, it's on my Instagram. It's my Instagram name. And, um, yeah. And if you could tell people um, one thing about rare diseases in general or about your specific disease, what would you want them to know? Well, I think a lot of people kind of think that maybe there isn't enough knowledge about rare diseases and Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome because it's rare, but I think a lot of the time it's not as rare as people think. You know, when you look at statistics about, you know, only this many people out of that many people has it, you're only looking at the people who actually get diagnoses or diagnoses. <laughs> um, and it's usually, like, the majority of people with EDS don't know that they have it. So there are so many many other cases that go undiagnosed as opposed to ones that actually do get diagnosed. And so people kind of think, you know, oh, it's not really that common, but I've seen people just, you know, friends and uh, family members, and I'm like, oh, you kind of look like you have EDS. And um, it can just be a lot more common than people think. And, and rare diseases in general, there's one in ten people that are affected by rare diseases. Yeah. yeah. So it's definitely more prevalent as a whole, maybe not particular diseases, because they are rare, but more than people think, as you said. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Michelle Cotton was another activist who shared the journey she and her husband have been on since their son's diagnosis with a rare disorder. Their son Mikey's disorder was diagnosed based on newborn screening results, and Michelle and her husband were told over the phone after they had brought Mikey back home from the hospital not what condition their son had, but only to make sure he was eating every two hours. They, gave, they were given very little information, just that something was very different about their son. And they later learned that Mikey's strict food schedule was imperative as he had a deficiency in an enzyme that breaks down fats. So he had been in and out of the hospital eight times, and he's only six years old. So she really stressed the importance of newborn screening, as many parents did at the event. That was one of the big focuses of the event. And she stressed the importance of this because she explained that if her son was born in a different state, so not Connecticut, his newborn screening would not have included the test that diagnosed him. So certain states do not have um, 
all of the tests that other states have. There's a variation between states and what newborn screening tests are included in that newborn screening um, umbrella. And so if Mikey was born in a different state, he may not have had this test that diagnosed him. And if he had not had that test, he would have died the first night home. So it, it really brings it home how important legislation is in these issues because if other states can include this specific test, babies with this condition will be saved. And this is just one case, one condition. There are so many others that are being pushed to be added on newborn screenings in other states, in Connecticut. So this is really where the legislative part really comes into play in the rare disease community. And there were so many patients sharing their stories and parents sharing stories of their children. I wish I had more time to share each one. But one point I want to make about the event is that these stories that we were hearing were very heartbreaking. But the air was charged with a spark of hope as the HB 697 passed, which created the Connecticut Rare Disease Task Force. So this was something to celebrate and progress has been made, um, especially in Connecticut for this. And so to have legislators be present at this event, hear these people's personal stories of struggles with medical bills, lack of treatments, was really promising for even more legislative support and more progress to be made. Legislators were also educated by scientists, not just by patients and their personal stories, but on the science side of things of researching rare diseases and finding treatments for these and the advancements that have already been made. The executive director of the Fibro Lamellar Cancer Foundation, John Hopper, asked the audience for four important points when he was presenting. And the first one was to know diseases, to know that rare diseases are out there, be familiar with some, know the signs of different rare diseases of saying, all right, well, if we, we see these kinds of things and we're not sure what it is, maybe it's a rare disease and have that mindset. Obviously, you can't know the 7,000 rare diseases that we've identified, but it's more of being aware of them. The second was to support any legislation for current research. So there is current research that has already been supported by legislation, and we need to continue that. It's hard to ask for even more funding. So he's kind of asking people to just kind of uh, bring it down and just say that let's at least support the research that we're currently doing. The third is to encourage young researchers. If we can encourage young people, such as you college students out there, to get involved in research, that's where we really make progress and that's where everything starts with research. And once we find out more about rare diseases, we can then start targeting, um, figuring out treatments, cures um, to help people with rare diseases. And the fourth is to work with industry to get repurposed drugs, orphan drugs, and new drugs for rare diseases. So when researching uh, one rare disease that may seem like, wow, you're pouring a lot of money into one rare disease that it really doesn't um, affect that many people, you know, some would say, is it worth the money? But something to keep in mind is that when, dis when we are researching one rare disease, we end up discovering more findings for another rare disease that's really similar because rare diseases are often very specific and there's bigger umbrellas within a lot of rare diseases. So if you discover something in one, oftentimes it will help in discovering about other rare diseases and furthering treatments for them. We're here celebrating rare diseases and hearing from a lot of presenters and you're doing research on a rare cancer that affects adolescents and, and young adults. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. The name of the cancer is fibrolamellar, that's your fibrolamellar hepatocellular carcinoma. It's a tongue twister there. Uh, very rare disease. It hits about 300 uh, new patients diagnosed per year worldwide. That's how it's actually called an ultra rare cancer. I was going to say that definitely is not one in 200,000. That's even less. And that's one of our biggest challenges, too, because it's so rare to get researchers to actually spend the time and the effort to research this disease versus larger disease is a huge challenge for us. Uh, but in essence, the disease, it's a liver cancer. It hits uh, perfectly normal, healthy young people 
Uh, no predispositions, no genetic history on it. Uh, they may have uh, stomach pains, might have pains going down their legs, things that might be something else. So they're really not diagnosed until stage four. And by that point, it's metastasized. So pretty much we have a survival rate of only 10% after two years. It's, it's that aggressive all the way. And our biggest challenge right now, again, is to get researchers from all over the world to spend the time and effort on this so we can find a cure. Okay. Thank you so much for sharing. Great. Thank you. Dr. Mark Lalandi, the director of the Stem Cell Institute, added on to points made by John Hopper by educating the audience on the advancements Yukon Health has made in the area of regenerative medicine. We had Caroline Dealey on the show here uh, back in August and also recently um, talking about regenerative medicine and the all of the awesome, cool advancements they've made over at Yukon Health. And they've successfully taken skin cells, turned those cells into stem cells to then have the potential to develop into any type of cell, such as heart cells, for instance. Uh, so that was really cool to hear from him and just hear that um, current advancements are being made and here's what we've been doing. And he kind of, as I just explained it, uh, explained it pretty easy to, in layman's terms to people. Um, and those are called induced pluripotent stem cells. Very cool area of medicine. Senator Richard Blumenthal couldn't attend the event in person, but he recorded this urgent message of how vital research for rare diseases is. So let's take a listen. I'm so sorry that I can't be with you in person today, but I'd like to welcome everyone to Rare Disease Day. I'm honored that the National Organization of Rare Disorders and the Fibrolamellar Cancer Foundation invited me to participate in this important day. I am proud to say that both of these organizations are based in Connecticut, representing over 32 million Americans facing some form of rare disease, including rare cancers. It is a sad irony that one in every 10 people will face a rare disease, making rare diseases, on the whole, far too common. Even more upsetting is that two-thirds of people diagnosed with a rare disease are children. The consequence that they must endure are often lifelong and serious. We must act together to raise awareness on rare diseases and work hard to guarantee that the men, women, and children suffering through rare diseases are not disregarded or neglected. Now more than ever, with the National Institutes of Health getting its largest funding increase in over a decade, we need to focus on rare disease research. Only 320 conditions out of 7,000 have an approved treatment. This shocking lack of treatments must change, and I will continue fighting for robust funding at the National Institutes of Health to lead to new cures, treatments, and therapies. The emotional and financial burden that rare diseases inflict on families and hence Connecticut as a whole, is tremendous. It simply cannot be ignored. Ensuring quality health care for all ensures and includes those with rare diseases. At the state and federal level, we must improve access to needed therapies by finding ways to lower the cost of prescription drugs, especially specialty drugs that are often used to treat these cancers and rare diseases. Finding ways to combat and prevent rare diseases will not be easy, but the need is too great and too important. Thank you again for allowing me to be a part of this Rare Disease Day. Let's join together at the state and federal level to truly make a difference in the lives of the many people in Connecticut, too many people who suffer from them. And I'm confident that finding cures to these awful diseases is squarely within our reach. Thank you so much. I caught up with Maddie Shaw at the end of the event. She's been on the show before talking about her rare disease, primary immunodeficiency disorder, and the impressive activist work she has been involved with. I'm here with Maddie Shaw at the Rare Disease Day event at the State House in Connecticut, and we just went through all of the presentations, and there was quite a big turnout. Um, so what are you feeling about the event? How do you think it went? I think it went extraordinarily well. There were a lot more people than I expected, and a lot more people who really were immersed in the content that we were all speaking about, and everybody here was aware of all the terminology we were using, and I think that it was like a very um, positive sign in the growth 
of the rare disease community, positive growth in the rare disease community. And there was a lot of people here from various backgrounds. We had legislators, we had researchers, um, geneticists included in that, and we had uh, lots of people that were either advocates or had a rare disease, or both like you, um, or were parents that were advocates of children and speaking about that. Um, were there any presentations other than yours um, that really spoke to you or things that you remember from it? I, quite honestly, all of them. I think all of them had that personal touch that you get when you talk to somebody who is connected to a rare disease in some way, whether it be from a geneticist's standpoint, I don't know how you would say that, um, their standpoint, a parent's standpoint, a patient's standpoint, um, there's always a connection and there's always something that lights that spark, and so what I find when I go to these events is I like to watch for where that spark lies within people, like the people who came up and were here as legislators but had their connection in their own family history and different ways that these disorders can affect people, whether it be direct or indirect. So I would honestly honestly say that I remember little bits and pieces of all of them and they really stick with me. They have a big impact on hearing yeah. people actually go up there and talk about it. You're not in a textbook. You're not a student reading things yeah. about disorders. You're actually hearing people that have these disorders and it definitely has a big human impact. You can get up and talk about all of the different, you know, proteins and cellular like deformities and all of these kinds of crazy scientific terms as much as we want but we can also find that in any textbook and so I think for me what like really hits home and what makes this all worthwhile is being able to watch the kids who come and they run around and they make jokes with everybody and they eat the Kit Kats that the guy handed out and they're smiling and laughing and you know their stories are harder than a lot of people's stories are and they're still able to be here and find a place where they have a community and find solace in the fact that their parents are advocating for their well-being. So for me I like watching the human side of all of the rare disease people. I like watching people interact. I like people finding common ground. I like watching everybody be able to have both like a happy moment maybe outside of the podium and then a very factual clinical moment on the podium. And I think it's really interesting to watch the diversity and all of that. And you're a teen with a rare disease. There's a lot of a lot of people affected by rare diseases are teenagers and kids. What would you say to any teenagers or kids listening that have a rare disease? I'm going to use my signature line. Yes, please do. <laughs> it's, I use it all the time. Um, so what I say to everybody is that these years are just your prologue. And essentially what I mean by that is that these years are the ones where you are put through the most trials and the most tribulations to basically figure out who you are and how you're going to be able to make decisions and what you can handle as a human being and in your heart and in your soul. And to keep in mind that your prologue is always the hardest part of your story, but when your story begins, it's what makes you who you are. And that can be an incredibly liberating and positive experience. And like you get to decide when your story starts and when you're ready to like take that leap from prologue to story. So these years are just helping you build the character that you want to be and that you're going to be. Remind our listeners what um, rare disease you have and the work that you've been doing to raise awareness for it. Um, okay, so I have common variable immune deficiency, which essentially means that two out of my five immunoproteins um, are like incredibly deficient, and then the rest are mutated, so they don't really work properly. Um, and so I require a treatment once every three weeks of immune globulin, an infusion that lasts about like six or seven hours. Um, I started my own organization when I was 13, um, branched off of the Immune Deficiency Foundation, and what they do is basically fundraise to raise awareness, to give money to researchers, to basically contribute to the overall well-being and quality of life of people living with primary immune deficiency disorders. And so I do essentially the same thing in my own little vein of going around mostly my town and local places and fundraising, like I'm starting to do a Pie for PI event that I'm going to be hosting in the spring, which is going to be the world's largest pie fight, like the Guinness Book of World Records um, accepted my application. So if we can get over a thousand people, we can all be in the Guinness Book of World Records for the world's largest pie fight. Which and do we know awesome. when this is happening? Uh, we don't have a confirmed date yet because we're waiting on a confirmed location, but as soon as I know, I can tell you so you guys can all come and get a pie in the face. Definitely, because who doesn't want to either have a pie in their face or throw a pie in <laughs> someone else's face. Exactly. 
One big topic that we've uh, heard a lot about today is insurance and having people not covered with all of their medications and people having to stay, one parent staying home and living off of one income. Um, how do you feel about the insurance and kind of what pushes we need to have for legislation? Well, I have lobbied on two bills so far to keep um, biologic medications in a copay as opposed to a coinsurance. And what that essentially means is that for somebody who needs biologic or specialty medication, someone like me, you, there is no genetic al or generic <laughs> alternative. So you can't go to the store, find the cheaper version, and use that at the checkout. You have to spend thousands and thousands of dollars. And unfortunately, what happens is insurance companies then capitalize on that and use that monopoly to drive the prices up and keep things in a co-insurance, which is basically you pay a percentage of the price as opposed to a flat rate of you know when you're going to stop paying because the price of these medications fluctuates all the time. So it's something that I hold very near and dear to my heart as somebody who lives with in a single parent household on one income, um, who wants to go to college and wants to be able to like go forge my own path but needs the funds for it. So. I would say right now our biggest thing is making sure that we have full coverage in what we are issuing to our citizens and also making sure that we are financially supportive of citizens because it costs less to keep a family in a copay than a co rather than a coinsurance than it does to keep somebody on welfare and I think that that's incredibly important. Thank you so much for being a great activist and just really being such an inspiration to other kids that have this and showing them that, you know, you can do it and you do make a huge difference speaking up and speaking to other people. And this event just had, as you said, such a very human aspect to it. So thank you so much. That's all the time I have today on DNA Today. Don't forget to raise awareness on social media for Rare Disease Day, hashtag Rare Disease Day. Participate in the tweet chat tomorrow, March 1st at 1 p.m. Eastern using the hashtag, hashtag ABCDRBChat. For information discussed in today's episode, hop on over to DNAPodcast.com. You can keep updated with what's happening in genetics at DNA Podcast on Twitter. Thanks for listening and join me next week, Monday, 1130 a.m. to learn and discover new advances in the world of genetics.